pray together. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. In the midst of the multitude of words in our daily lives, speak your eternal word to us that we may respond to your gracious promises with faithfulness, service and love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and I hand the time over to Pastor Ben. Thank you, Annabelle and Wayne, for leading us in the time of worship. It's great for us to be back in the house of the Lord, and it's great for me uh, and Pastor Ming to be back in Singapore together with uh, Audrey. Uh, last week, we were in Cambodia for a mission trip, and we're glad to be back in Singapore to be with all of you this Sunday. But Pastor Ming is not here this Sunday because she is preaching at Aldersgate Methodist Church this morning, uh, and he's, she's preaching in Mandarin, so please pray for her. <laughs> <laughs> we are in our pledge month, and last week, Pastor Tsuhei began our sermon series on giving uh, by preaching a very good sermon on how giving helps in growing humility. He gave an overview of why it is important for us as believers to give and how it helps us to grow and also to help the church grow. And so this week, we continue in our sermon series on how giving helps in growing contentment. And I will be referring to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 to 6 in the sermon. But before we read this verse together, I want to give an overview of Hebrews in the book of, where this passage is situated in the book of Hebrews so far. If you've been following our Encounter Journal Bible reading plan, you will know that we've been reading through Hebrews, and um, you would know that in Hebrews, uh, the first few chapters were all about how Jesus is greater because the author of Hebrews sets out to accomplish two purposes in his letter to the church. He wants to tell them that Christ is greater than everything and therefore deserves to be worshipped. That's one. Number two, he then tells them to hold on to Christ in faith, even in spite of persecution, even in spite of temptation, for them then to hold on to Christ in faith. And so the author of Hebrews starts off by saying in chapter 1 and 2 that Christ is greater than all the angels. In 3 and 4, Christ is greater to even Moses who gave us to the Jews the Old Testament, the Torah, the covenant. Christ is greater than even Moses. And then 5 to 7, Christ is greater to all the priests. And so Christ can represent us to God. And then 7 to 10, Christ is greater than all the sacrifices. And so Christ can mediate, therefore, our relationship between God and us. And then in chapter 11, he goes on to list down all the heroes of faith from Abraham, Moses, and onwards. And then now, at the beginning of chapter 12, he says, Therefore, therefore, if Christ is greater than all these, how then do we live out our lives? Therefore, how do we hold on to Christ in faith? And then he lists many things that we ought to do. And then we reach chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. How do we live our lives of faith, holding on to Christ, who is greater than all? Therefore, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what can men do to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. In this sermon today, the main point that I'm driving at is this, that giving grows contentment. Giving grows contentment. And following the structure of the two verses, we will start off by looking at how we don't, we ought not to love money. Don't love money. What do we do then? Do be content. Why? Because God is faithful. So what do we do? We give. What do we do? We give. Don't love money. Do be content. Why? Because God is faithful. What do we do? We give. And in giving, giving grows contentment. 
I grew up watching a cartoon about a duck. Some of you may know this duck. He's called Scrooge McDuck. If I'm not wrong, he's the uncle of Donald Duck. At least that's what I can remember. Scrooge McDuck is an unhappy duck. He's a frustrated duck. And he's a duck who always wears a frown on his face, as you can see from the slide. He's one who is never happy. And he's never happy because he always thinks that he doesn't have enough money. He's happiest only when he dives into his great vault of gold nuggets. And when he comes up, he's again unhappy because he sees that his vault, the depth of the gold that he has, has not grown further. And then he becomes, he becomes very quickly unhappy again. He's one who is never happy. And that's where his treasure is. His heart is with his treasure. His heart is with the goal. And if the goal doesn't grow, he is always unhappy and anxious. He is one Scrooge. He is Scrooge McDuck. And that reminds us of what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Scrooge McDuck's heart was already in his treasure. And if his treasure doesn't start growing more and more, his heart is unhappy. If that is what we treasure, our hearts will naturally be drawn towards it and be given to it. If our hearts are drawn towards money, our hearts will be given over to money and our hearts will then not be able to give to God what God deserves. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, if Christ is the greatest, then keep your life free from the love of money. If Christ is the greatest, whose kingdom cannot be shaken, and that's what we read in, that's what, uh, in, ver- in chapter 12 says, if Christ is the greatest and his kingdom cannot be shaken, then why give your life to money? Because money will be shaken. Money is perishable. Money will be gone one day. So why? Why give your life to money, but rather keep your life from the love of money? Just before this verse is verse 4. In verse 4, the writer of Hebrews says this, Let the marriage be held in honour among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And then straight after, he goes on to write, keep your life free from the love of money. How does this two link? Well, the famous theologian and pastor, John Stott, writes, it's both of these, about adultery, about marriage, as well as about money, it's about covetousness. One can covet someone else that is not supposed to be yours, whether a single male or lady or someone else's spouse. One can covet for someone in our marriage who is not supposed to be ours. And likewise, one can covet money to the detriment of our spiritual health as well. Covetousness is at the heart of both verse 4 and verse 5. When the love of money becomes our obsession, it becomes our master. It controls all of our lives and the decisions that we make, affecting what we give our time to, affecting our relationships, affecting our perspectives of life. And there's some dangers of the love of money. When we love money and only love money, we're unable to love others. We're unable to part with our money in our love for others. When we love money, we place our trust in that which is shakeable. And when things are shaken, we become distraught, we become anxious. When we see our bank accounts like Struch Madak see his gold drop, when we see our bank's account drop, we become anxious because these are all shakeable. We begin to trust in these shakeable things, but not in the unshakeable God himself. We begin to trust in these gifts we have been given but not trust in the giver himself. We become 
truly discontent over time. Remember when Jesus talked about the rich young ruler. There was this rich young ruler, rich of course, and young, with many, many years ahead of him. He comes to the Lord and he asks the Lord, Lord, what can I do to gain eternal life? And the Lord said, you have done many things, and rightly so, the rich young ruler has done many things, godly things in his life. And then the Lord says, there's one thing that you have not done. Sell your possessions and give to the poor and come follow me. And we read that the rich young ruler left Jesus very, very unhappy because that's the one thing that he couldn't give up and in so forsaking eternal life. And so keep your life free from money because that is shakeable and that doesn't help us to trust in what ultimately is unshakable and eternal. And because of that, when we trust in things that are shakeable, we will always be discontent. We will always be wanting more. We will always be frustrated because there's always more that can be gotten. Someone once said that there is only one guy in the world with the most money. The rest of us all have less. Isn't it true? There's only one guy in the world who has the most money and all of us have less. All these comparison, covetousness, it can cover all the other areas as well. You know, someone will always have better relationships. Someone will always have higher positions. Someone will always have more power. I read somewhere um, just two weeks ago about a Harvard student. This Harvard student topped her class in her year. She was the best student with the best scores in her year, but she was disappointed. Why? Because her absolute scores had not been better than the all-time best in Harvard in the past. Comparisons, covetousness, it leads to anxiety, and anxiety never ends. Covetousness is born of doubt, but contentment is a child of faith. Covetousness is born of doubt, but contentment is a child of faith. And so the writer of Hebrews says, keep your life from the love of money. And that's the first point. Don't love money. Don't make the possession of money be an end in itself. But then second, be content. Don't love money, but be content. He goes on to write, and be content with what you have. First, he points out the negative don't. Don't love money. And now the positive command, be content with what you have. The word be, right, it's a commandment. It's, he, he didn't say feel contentment, feel content. He says be content. It's something that we have to work towards. We have to work towards being contented. We have to be content. It's a command for us to be content. And this appeal of contentment in the New Testament, reverbs through the whole, test, whole of the New Testament. Jesus himself said, for us to be, free from, uh, to be free from worry is to commit all of ourselves unto a Lord. Again, don't worry. Be content. Submit ourselves to, to the Lord. This contentment helps us ultimately to trust in Christ himself, who is unshakable, who is the giver, who is the giver of all things that we need and the giver of life, we are able to then trust, even if our bank accounts go a bit lower, even if someone else gets a promotion, we are able to still be content and not be anxious. This appeal for contentment in the New Testament is not also meant to convey the idea that we are not to be ambitious to work hard, you know, to, do, to work hard for the Lord. No, we all ought to bring our best to our jobs, our profession, to what we do, recognizing that we want to do our best for the Lord, but not for money, not for possessions, not for our own ambitions. But we want to work hard as a good witness of who we are in the Lord. And so being contented is uh, not to say that we should not be ambitious and to work hard, but we should be ambitious for the Lord and not for 
ourselves. We are content, even as we work hard, to leave the end results to God. We are to be ambitious for God's purposes and for God's will. For God's will. And when we do so, we are able to work hard with great contentment in our lives, trusting that at the end of the day, God brings about what He will and what He purposes, for He has got good, pleasing and perfect plans that He wants to bring to pass. Indeed, it brings about joy in our hearts to know that we can work hard, but with great contentment because the end results depends on what God will do. We need not worry about what others think or say. We need not worry about whether we get a promotion or not. We need not fret whether others are getting more than us and always or always worrying that we're not good enough. And so Benjamin Franklin, as you will know, the, one of the presidents in the United States in the past, uh, who was also uh, apparently a poet and a writer, an editor of a newspaper, he was rich himself, he said this, he said, contentment makes poor men rich. But this contentment makes rich men poor. Contentment makes poor men rich, but this contentment makes rich men poor. And it's so true. When we're content, we are happy, we know that we have enough, and we can enjoy the things that we already have. But when we are discontent, it makes even rich people think that we are poor and we do not have enough and we'll always be anxious and worry and always be frustrated because we want more and more. Covetousness, therefore, anxiousness for more, therefore, can be overcome by contentment. Contentment makes poor men rich. Giving grows contentment. Don't love money. Be content. Why? Because God is faithful. We can trust in God who is our provider. God is faithful. And so the writer of Hebrews says, for he, say, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can men do to me. It reminds us of what Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews has said earlier in his letter. He says in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 16, let us, then draw, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. As we draw close to God, God who is, will never leave us nor forsake us, we will find mercy, we will find grace to help us in our time of need. This first part of, uh, this first part of how God is always with us, I will never leave you nor forsake you, it's a reminder to the readers of, or the hearers of the letter to the Hebrews of what Moses told the people, even as they left Egypt in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses assures the people of Israel at a point in time, as they left Egypt, a land that at a point in time was full of riches and abundance, they had full stomachs, even though they were slaves, they were not lacking in food. And even as they left Egypt, Moses assures them that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord will still provide for you, even in the wilderness. And the listeners of, or readers of Hebrews would have recognized that this is, what the, this is what Moses told the people, that the Lord, God himself, will never leave you nor forsake you. And so you will always have what you need. You will always be provided for with what you will need. You will not starve and you will survive. In this second part of the verse about how uh, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, comes from Psalms, Psalm 118, verses 5 to 7. You see in verse 6, The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me, He is my helper. Something that he, the Hebrews writer refers to. I look in triumph on my enemies. 
And so you see the context of why the author of Hebrews would quote Psalm 118 is because uh, commentators think that in the time of Hebrews, they were were undergoing persecution. And undergoing persecution, the authorities were removing them from their homes and confiscating their property. And so now the author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 118 that the Lord is their helper. What can men do to him? Or do to them. Because in verse 5, it says, When hard pressed, I cried out to the Lord, and he brought me into a spacious place. The Lord gives even place for us to stay, even if your homes are confiscated, even if you know you're you, you are homeless, even if you find yourself without a place to live. The Lord is the provider, the Lord is the helper, the Lord will bring us into spacious places. It's a reminder of how indeed the Lord never forsakes us, never leaves us. We can confidently indeed say that the Lord is our helper and we need not fear for ourselves. And the basis of this therefore contentment is God's faithfulness to His people. God will always be faithful to His people. Not just in the big things, but even in the small things of life. As I said earlier, Pastor Ming and I were in Cambodia last week and we met a missionary couple. And this missionary couple was telling us how the Lord met their needs. The wife uh, said that, you know, she had been craving, because she has been in Cambodia now for quite a while, uh, since the last time she was back in Singapore. And one day, she woke up in the morning craving for chi chong fan. She said, she thought to herself, I think I want to eat chi chong fan. I miss chi chong fan today. And she said that the whole day she thought about chi chong fan. When she, was, when she was cooking lunch for her family, she thought, how good it would be if we've got chi chong fan. In the evening, when they're eating dinner together, he was, she was thinking, ah, if only we had chi chong fan. The next day, another missionary had decided to cook a meal. And the other missionary, who is our own missionary, uh, Carol Ong decided that she would cook chi chong fan for herself. And because she had cooked so much, she decided she would bring some chi chong fan over to this missionary couple as well. And so when uh, this wife of this, of this missionary couple saw the chi chong fan, she said, Ah, the Lord knows even my smallest ones and my smallest needs. But it's not just for her. Because she then told us that, you know, uh, my husband had also been praying and uh, wanting to buy some cashew nuts. And so, you know, Cambodia cannot find uh, chi chong fan, but can find cashew nuts, right? But they've been so busy, they were unable to go to the supermarket uh, to buy cashew nuts. And so, uh, you know, the husband wanted to have cashew nuts with with his oats, but he couldn't have for almost two weeks already. But that afternoon, the same very afternoon that they got the Chi Fan in the morning, the same very, af- very afternoon, a local uh, Cambodian had placed a packet of cashew nuts and blessed the missionary couple with cashew nuts as well. And so uh, the wife of this missionary couple said, the Lord knows not just me, but my husband too, and gave us all that we need, Chi Chong Fan and cashew nuts. If we place our trust in the Lord, we need not worry because He knows even our smallest desires and meets our needs. Don't love money. Do be content. Why? Because God is faithful. Then what do we do then? We give. If covetousness results in this love of money and placing for hearts in what is shakeable, then the opposite of coveting, which is giving, helps us then to be content. Because giving results in contentment because we learn to trust in the Lord and not in the money that we have for us, for, to provide for us. We begin to trust in the Lord and not in the money. We begin to trust in the giver and not the gifts. And we are content regardless of how much or how little we have when we are able to give. When we give, we begin to place our trust in the Lord and that results in contentment. If covetousness 
results in the love of money. Giving results in contentment. And Pastor Tsui touched on this quote briefly last week on John Wesley. John Wesley commentators have summarized what he uh, preached and what he wrote and into these three short, succinct sentences. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Because John Wesley knows that as Christians, we will work hard, we can earn. We earn all we can, and then we will save. Save all we can, but in order not for us to end up being tempted by money, by the love of money, John Wesley advocates for Christians, Methodists at that point in time, to give all they can, so that they don't be embroiled or be ensnared with the love of money because they are able to then give and focus on God who is the provider instead. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Giving is an antidote to covetousness. Giving is an antidote to the love of money. It builds contentment. For we, remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, again, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so the willingness to part with money shows where our hearts is. Our hearts, where our true treasure is, to lie with Christ. When we are willing to part with our money, we show that our treasure is with Christ, who is giver himself, and not where the money is. Remember Scrooge Madak? If hoarding is a sign of covetousness and anxiety, then giving is a sign of contentment and trust. If hoarding is a sign of covetousness and anxiety, then giving is a sign of contentment and trust. When we give, we are showing that we are content with what we have, trusting in God who is the provider, one who will never leave us, or forsake us, one who is greater than all things. Giving grows contentment. So let us not love money. Don't love money. Do be content. Why? Because God is faithful. What do we do? We give. Because giving helps in growing contentment. Let us pray together. Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of us being able to give. Being able to give is a privilege because it shows that we do have, and you have already provided for us. And that's why we're able to give even of something back to you. We thank you indeed for this privilege. And we thank you that as we give, we begin to trust more and more in you. Being content with what you have already given us and able to give for the sake and for the benefit of others. Trusting in how, Lord, you will never leave us nor forsake us. Even if some of us worry that we may not have enough, being able to give shows that we do trust in you. And so, Lord, come, help us to give today indeed. For giving helps us to grow in contentment. It helps us not to be anxious, but it helps us to trust in you. We thank you, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.